uh, study of all the prophets is very profitable for us today. A lot of times we fail to understand his message because of the way that they uh, presented things. It's sometimes it's a little strange to us, but uh, once you understand what they're talking about, then it becomes uh, very clear. Presently, we are in the study of Joel. You may want to turn over to that. And I'd stopped at verse 18 of the second chapter, but I want to back up a little bit and start with uh, 12. And here, God is pleading with the uh, his audience that he's pleading for their repentance. He says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. He did not want a, necessarily an outward manifestation of repentance. He wanted a change of the heart. He wanted uh, contriteness and genuine uh, sorrow for having sinned against him. And that's the way it has always been. And that's the one of the, the primary messages, I think, of the, uh, of the prophets, all the prophets, is that God will punish sin. And it doesn't matter if it's the uh, nation of Israel or the, we may call them heathen nations or the uh, pagans or non-Jewish nations. It doesn't matter. He will punish sin. And the only way to avoid punishment is repentance. And this is what uh, Joel is saying through this uh, imagery of the locust. It's bad. It's really bad. But eternal judgment is going to be worse. Eternal uh, condemnation. If one were to be... Uh, lives their life such that they lose their hope of heaven, instead are uh, delivered to eternal punishment, it's much worse. But nevertheless, uh, the prophet here, Joel, uses the imagery of something that the uh, these people did understand. They understood about locusts and the devastation that locusts brought to the uh, people. So using a material event, if you will, to convey a, a spiritual message. The 13 says, Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. And I may mention before about this idea of relenting. It, it's not the same thing, same kind of relenting that we think of. You know, we uh, think of relenting a lot of times is that somebody is uh, laid on their debt, or whatever, whatever it may be, and they come begging, just say, you know, don't, don't call the don't do, don't do it. It's, it's okay, I'm, you know. That's not the same sort of relenting that uh, we're talking about here. You may look at... Uh, uh, Jeremiah, in fact, let's just go over there. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, I believe. You know, I've heard some commentators that, that God changes his mind. I don't think God ever changes his mind. I think, I think he knows exactly what's going to happen. But he's laid, put out a, a condition here. Let's see. Uh, I think I may have that right. Uh, talking about the potter the, of the clay. Uh, let's see, where is it? Do I? I'm sorry. 
three. Verse starting verse six, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, look at uh, look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, God's in control. If that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster I thought to bring upon it. So here we have one horn of the uh, uh, situation is that's punishment if they do evil. Uh, but if they turn from the evil, then it, you, they're not going to be punished. And the instant, verse 9, in the instance I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I said would benefit it. <clears throat> so those are the two conditions, either good or punishment. That's always been the case. And it's always been the case that obedience will result in good and disobedient will result in evil. There is no middle ground. That's it. So when, when uh, we talk about relenting, it's, it's falling from one category to the other. It's shifting from one category to the other. Yes. yes. The change is on our part. Just a, the, the change is our part. And he's, he's laid it out clearly exactly what the uh, result's going to be. We're the ones that decide. We're the ones that decide. So it's a different, I think, a little different concept than uh, what man may think of as relenting. And all through, at least uh, certain of the prophets, all through the Bible, there's this plea the people, to, in, in the exercise of their own free will, to choose obedience rather than disobedience. And the uh, destiny of those two groups, those that obey and those that don't, is set out very clearly, and it does not change. It does not change. Everyone is going to be in one place or the other. So anyway, any more comments? Well, this is just one of the best things in the world that shows God is what he is. He puts this in his name. And if you love him, obey, he bless you. That's exactly you know, right. Yeah. If you don't repent, they punish you. Now, if we change, we get back on the blessing side. And he said, from the beginning, he used that. Well, that's one of the things of the prophets. He's trying to get them back on the good, the good side. He's trying to get them back. The and James used the word repent, and that's caused some problems because uh, he was saying one place, he repented God that he did this, but he never said another, God can't repent. And that confused me. But God never repents like you repent or I repent. No, not like we do, no. Yeah, I've thought about, uh, you know, Isaac and uh, Abraham and Isaac when he offered Isaac up. And, got, you know, after uh, he stopped Abraham from plunging the knife into Isaac, he said, now I know. He knew all along. That was for Abraham, too. Yeah, but Abraham didn't know. <laughs> Abraham didn't know. And he also said concerning the structure of the world, he defended God to be Yeah. Yeah, see, that's a, that's a wrong concept to, to think of uh, repenting. It's uh, sometimes it's just accommodative language. I think the greatest thing that comes out of that is when he promises me, if I love him and obey him, I'll always be blessed. Heaven will be my home. Yeah. Because there's no change in heaven. Yeah. Because he said, if you don't lose, then you don't lose. But it also has the same thing for the person who's determined to say, I'm all right with God, but yet I need to be to God. It won't work. 
You know, we pray a lot of times, uh, we ought to be praying a lot of times about uh, becoming more spiritual, more Christ-like, this, that, the other. But we want it to be easy. <laughs> and that's not always the case. You know, we have to go through a period of testing. Does God know how we will fare under those tests? Well, yes. He knows everything that's the, uh, the object of knowledge. But we don't know. That's why we have tests. So we will know. And so we can prove to ourselves that, yes, we will be obedient to his will, come what may. But here he's uh, pleading with these individuals to uh, repent, to rend your gar heart, not your garments. And, so he, and who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. He's going to... All the things that the locusts have destroyed, he's going to uh, replace it if they repent. If they repent. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate it fast. Again, this blowing the trumpet of uh, Zion is not like the previous one, which was uh, sounding alarm, but this is to call people to meeting for the purpose of uh, this repenting, this uh, uh, sanctifying the congregation. It's just symbol of the elders. Gather yeah, children and nursing babes and bridegroom uh, go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. This is so important. People are to cease from their normal activities to participate in this uh, repenting. He said, let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. That kind of gives the idea that if they don't repent, uh, you know, the, the locusts were sort of called a, a nation. But I think the idea here is that if you don't repent, something is worse going to come along. There are going to be nations, real nations, that are going to come and uh, rule over you. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? You're going to bring reproach to God, at the name of God himself, if you don't repent. Uh, people will say, well, you say this is an all-powerful God. You know, why are you in the condition you're in? Of course, they could say, because we didn't repent, but that's not the way nations think. So we start in verse 18. Then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them, and I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. Uh, this is making an assumption that these people, in fact, have repented or did repent. And if they do, uh, being a merciful God, he's going to have pity on them. He's going to send them grain and, and the things that the locusts have eaten. He's going to restore that. And, uh, you know, you're going to be satisfied. You know, you're in, you're in hunger and... Uh, in need now and because of the locust they were um, a spectacle to the nations they had nothing they would have nothing <clears throat> but in verse 20 it says I removed far from you the northern army and it, it's thought that these locusts did come from the north uh, may have come from a different direction but you know, the idea is that they're coming from the north and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face towards the eastern sea that's the Dead Sea and his back towards the western sea <clears throat> so it's going to be facing the east and his stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things you know given the the just the mass of locusts, if they were to be uh, driven to the east, there's desert in the east, and they, if they were just to pile up, it would create quite, a, quite an odor, a very foul odor. And it says in verse 21, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. They'll benefit from the uh, repentance 
of these people also. For the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine yield their strength. So things are going to be restored, assuming that they repent. And it, it, kind of the assumption here is that they have repented. So those things are going to be restored. So there's blessing from obedience to God. You know, particularly, there's a spiritual blessing, but there's also a material blessing because people don't participate in those things that can cause them harm. But there's evil out there. You know, those that are faithful are a very small group, and they will suffer from evil perpetuated by those who are, are not Christians. That's, that's going to happen. But spiritually, people will always be blessed when they are obedient to God's will. Um, verse 23, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down to you, the former rain, the latter rain, and the threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vast vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. There's going to be great blessing from this uh, repentance and obedience. And the things that they had before the locusts came, they're going to have again. So I, I will, in verse 25, so I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, consuming locust, and the chewing locust. Great army which I sent among you is going to be gone. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of your Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame in the Lord. Then you shall know, verse 27, that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. This is a demonstration that there is all these idols have no power whatsoever. This is a demonstration that there is one God in heaven who has control over everything. And if one puts their faith in this God, they shall never come to shame. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants, and on my maid servants. And I will pour out my spirit in those days. Well, it's not these days; it's those days, whatever those days are. Uh, and this is the assuming again that this is the uh, one of the first books written. It'd be the first mention of a Holy Spirit. And, of course, uh, Peter references this in the uh, first sermon on Pentecost. He, he's saying that what's happening there on Pentecost is what Joel is talking about. So these are the days when Peter's uh, speaking. He says, Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, old men shall dream dreams and see visions. So we have three... Uh, complementary means of uh, conveyance of inspiration. You got prophecy, you got dreams and visions. That's talked about many times throughout the uh, Bible. And this uh, spirit being poured out is going to be on men servants and maid servants. If you have uh, King James, it may say, uh, what does it say, by the way? Yeah, talk about slaves, really, servants. And if you think about it, there, there was never a prophet in the Old Testament that was a slave. So, and of course, this is referenced by Peter in the revealing of the gospel. So the idea is that the gospel is going to be for everybody, it's a, it's a 
different worldview, it's not going to be limited to Jews or to any one uh, racial group. It's going to be for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Or any Greeks or anything like that, or. Everybody is going to have the same access to the saving gospel as any other person. And if you recall, uh, when the, the Holy Spirit was poured out on uh, Pentecost and, of course, Cornelius and, and others, it was not a universal, uh, I should say, the miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit was not universal. Not everybody received the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. But what everybody did receive was, was the saving message of the gospel. That's what uh, everyone had access to. And that is uh, God's power to save the gospel. In verse 30, he said, I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And these are really uh, images of something that's very terrible and drastic that's going to happen. And, of course, it could be uh, just talking about the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 1870. Uh, but, it, you know, the, the great and terrible day of the Lord is always a day of, of uh, severe judgment. Uh, some aspect of judgment is going to happen. In 32, even though there's going to be this great and terrible day of the Lord, in 32, <clears throat> and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's the gospel. You know, to call on the name of the Lord is to uh, hear the saving message of the gospel and render obedience to its call. And that's a universal calling. Is be baptized. Yeah, calling on the name. Yeah. Yeah, this calling on the name of the Lord, you know, is, uh, of course there's what some say that you just uh, acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ and is your Savior and that's it. But calling on the name of the Lord always carries the idea of obedience to his will, always. It's not merely mentioning his name. It's not merely mentioning that he is uh, the Son of God, the Christ. It's more than that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we always quote John 3.16 uh, that uh, God so loved the world that whosoever believeth. Uh, but that, that believing also carries the idea of obedience, not just merely you know, the, the, the devil sort of uh, belief, acknowledging that he is, in fact, who he says he is, it's more than that. It's rendering, rendering obedience to him. It says, and for uh, in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. Now, Mount Zion is not the physical, at least here, is not the physical Mount Zion. There is a Mount Zion, uh, but it's not the physical Mount Zion. And, of course, you know, there is a physical Jerusalem, but it is not the physical Jerusalem. Well, where is their deliverance today? Those that are delivered, where are they? It's a spiritual Mount Zion and a spiritual Jerusalem. Isn't that the church? That's where those that are saved are delivered. As the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. And they're called by the gospel. In chapter 3, For behold, in those days, 
And at that time, well, when are those days and that time? Well, it's talking about this time that uh, when the Spirit's going to be poured out. I will bring, bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, we don't really know where the valley of Jehoshaphat is. If, if it is, it's talking about a physical uh, valley, but it has the idea of judgment, the valley of judgment. And he says, I will enter into judgment with them there on the account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. Well, certainly the uh, Jews were scattered among the nations, but if you think about the uh, Christians, they are also scattered among the nations. And there's going to be a, a valley of judgment for those who did the scattering. In verse 3, if I can turn a page, In verse, in chapter 3, you know why I quit being an auditor? Because I couldn't turn the checks over. <laughs> it says, for behold, uh, in verse, verse 3 of chapter 3, it says, they have also divided up my land, they have cast lots for my people, this casting lots was a um, uh, something that they did quite often back then when they had a decision to make. And you might recall that there were lots cast to replace uh, Judas. Matthias was uh, selected on the basis of that. So this was a common practice back then. They have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy in exchange for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. These things are going to be uh, brought to the valley of judgment. Indeed, what you have done, which, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philistia? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your retaliation upon your head. It does these people who have done these injustices to God's people to think that they are going to retaliate against the uh, Most High God. It is just not going to happen. And because they're, they, they, they can only retaliate against the uh, people of God, and God says, if you do that, I'm going to turn it on your head. What goes around comes around. In verse 5, because you have taken my silver and my gold, they did carry away all these things out of the uh, temple, things that were dedicated to the temple, and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem you have sold to the Greeks, that you may remove them far from their borders. The Greeks are just those are not the uh, Jews. And they were sold as slaves. And of course they went uh, everywhere and they're going to be punished for it. They would be brought into judgment for doing that. And of course you know this happened uh, to the Christians as well. In fact, upon the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, of course the Jews were sold by the thousands into slavery and, and some Christians also, but the Christians pretty much avoided the destruction of Jerusalem. But there were persecutions later on, so that uh, they didn't escape it entirely. In verse 7, Behold, I will raise them out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your retaliation upon your own head. What goes around comes around. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the people of Judah. 
So they will suffer the same things that they had been doing themselves. And I will sell them to the uh, Sabaeans, to people far off, as for the Lord has spoken. And since this is a proclamation from on high, it, it's going to happen. You know, it doesn't always just happen the, uh, the next week. And as we say, a lot of these prophecies took hundreds of years to uh, take place, but nevertheless they did. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, and let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. They can prepare for war, but they will not be victorious. They will beat their uh, farming implements into uh, implements of war but it's not going to do any, them any good and I think that the difference between them and the people of God is that I believe it's in Isaiah that Isaiah instructed them to uh, beat their swords into plowshares the, exactly the opposite uh, effort let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of judgment. And there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. All nations will have to be judged, even the uh, nation of the United States, for example. There will be a national judgment. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the wine press is full and the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. There's a time when all these uh, uh, wicked things that these nations do will uh, be full. And when that time comes, they will be punished. When is that time? I don't know. But it will come. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. It's going to be a lot of people there for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision the sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness there's going to be a uh, very significant time when you talk about sun and moon grow, going to grow dark stars will diminish that means something very significant is going to happen The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. Again, it's, it's um, likely talking about the spiritual Zion and spiritual Jerusalem. Heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people. There's safety in the Lord in obedience to him. He said, uh, The Lord will be a shelter for his people in the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy, and no alien shall ever pass through her again. There are not going to be any foreign nations that are going to enter Jerusalem. And if he's talking about a, a, a spiritual Jerusalem, there's not going to be those that are not obedient to his will that are going to be in the spiritual Jerusalem. They're not going to be there. There's only two places, heaven or hell. There is no middle ground. So if you're obedient, you'll be in the spiritual Jerusalem. But if you're not, you're not going to pass through. You cannot pass through to the spiritual Jer Jerusalem. 18, it will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. Of course, it's kind of a desert area, so water is very important. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and the water from the valley of Acacias. 
And again, talking about the uh, these these days that he's talking about when the gospel is proclaimed. That's the time that there be great blessing. Just as these people, agrarian society, uh, look forward to rain and uh, uh, great uh, harvest and what have you, that's a great blessing to them. For those that are in spiritual Jerusalem, in those days it's going to be the same. Egypt shall be a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness. Those that are opposed to God will come to naught and in fact be destroyed because of violence against the people of Judah. Where well, both of them, Edom and Egypt, uh, visited destruction upon the Hebrew children. And so they, they will, the, the, the physical nations, certainly uh, suffered punishment. For they have shed innocent blood in their land, but Judah shall abide forever. Not the physical tribe of Judah, but spiritual Judah is going to abide forever. And Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will acquit them of blood guilt, whom I had not acquitted for the Lord dwells in Zion. So we need to be certain that we also dwell in this spiritual Zion, in this uh, spiritual J Jerusalem, where there, therein is safety and uh, great blessing, and there's no other place. There is no middle ground. Well, next time we'll start uh, with Jonah, it'll be Jonah. Thank you for your kind attention.